All right, Blake. So let me talk a little bit about kind of the, the types of people that we might bump into or when you're trying to help a friend or somebody's kind of known the traditional stuff or listen to Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman, some of those kind of folks. I listened to them too in the beginning when I started in 2005. And now 17 years later, you know, being at the top of my game with the Renovating Retirement Podcast, 2000 Financial Plans Later, training financial advisors, speaking at the conferences, I have a little bit of a different view than the traditional, not because I'm a weirdo, but because instead of embracing tradition, like what are the traditions? Pay off your house, postpone taxes to a later date because you're going to be in a lower tax bracket and use the stock market, use what we call securities, stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, but diversify them, put them in different areas. When I went and studied all three of those, I, I found I didn't agree with any of them. And I know that can be shocking for people. I've been preaching the same message for 17 years. I call them the three pillars of financial deception. Um, I just found when I studied who said it first, who came up with the idea and does it still work today? I just found that none of them still work today. You know, why, why do we pay off mortgages? We pay off mortgages because of the depression because back during the twenties and thirties, the type of mortgage that people had said, even if you're making your payments, if we want the money, we can call the note due in 90 days. So during the depression, a lot of people that were making their mortgage payments lost their homes and people said mortgages are bad. Today, it's a much easier financial decision. It's what do mortgages cost versus what is our money earning? If you're making 6% on a dollar, you don't ever want to take that dollar, pay down a mortgage to save three or 4%. It's a terrible financial decision and it doesn't help you in any way. So I've had 15 homes. I don't pay off any of my mortgages. I wrote a book on this. I've got one hour conference, uh, one hour webinars on this on my YouTube channel. Anybody can study it. But when you get around, when you go all the way around the mountain, like you go, oh, I'm supposed to do what the banks and the insurance companies do, not what they tell me to do. What do banks do? They give us one or 2% on CDs. That's called debt. They're literally trying to pay interest. They're trying to get into debt. If we give them money, they pay low interest. Why are they doing that? Because they want to lend it out on cars and homes at three, four or 5%, which is called arbitrage. It's exactly the same thing as um, wholesale retail. So I wrote a book on this. It's only 28 pages. You're welcome to have it. You can send it to your client. That's fine. So mortgages, you know, stock market's another one. It's very popular, very common. By the way, I watched my mother retire in 1999 because the stock market was doing so well. Her advisor said, just stay in the stock market over every 10 year period. It does really well, blah, blah, blah. And that advisor was right back then, but it still was the wrong decision because is the stock market guaranteed to go well, Blake? No. No. Do, we, do you and I control it? <laughs> No, no. So from 1970 to 1999, look at what the market made. There's a fake number we won't talk about right now. I've got all kinds of materials on that, but this real actual compound annual growth rate, almost 14%. That's rocking high. I mean, that's crazy high. And because of this, it goes up and down. But because of this, we have something called the 4% rule, which William Bengen got a Nobel prize for. If you study William Bengen on Wikipedia, You'll find out he did his research before um, the modern crashes that we've had. And he said, you could take 4%. So if you have a million dollars, you can take $40,000 a year. And most of the time you're okay. The reason I'm contrarian, the reason you hear me on my podcast, my books, the trainings you attend is everything has changed in the world. The last 21 full years before fees and before taxes, the market is compounding at 6.59, not 13.78. This is not Charlie Jewett saying the market's bad. I'm not Ken Fisher going, I hate annuities and you should too. It's stupid. I don't hate any of the tools. I'm just monitoring how they perform and saying, is that a smart decision? Like, should anybody retire and leave all their money in the market? 100%. No, not with the last 21 years average. Plus, this caused me to go look at what are the competitors? Like, what else is out there besides the stock? What if the stock market didn't exist? If I lost my vision, Blake, I would get better at using my ears and my sense of touch. You've actually seen that with people that are have a handicap of some type, right? 
I pretended, what if the stock market didn't exist? And said, what else is out there? And I found something I wasn't looking for. I wanted to know what else was out there. What I did not expect to find was that all of the competitors, all of the safer tools to the stock market actually made more money, not just safer, <laughs> not just better for retirement, not just more guarantees, not just a floor, perhaps let's say where you can't lose money. They are actually earning more than the market. So the number one most important message for any human being who has assets to hear is it is not true that more risk equals more reward anymore. Not in the last 21 years. If you go back to 1970, 1980, I don't care about the weather reports from 1972, the year I was born. I don't care about the traffic reports from 1980 or 1990 when I graduated high school. I don't care. It doesn't matter what's going on right now, right? Right now, the weather of finance is the stock market is not worth the risk. There's nothing to be had in the stock market. What's another way to look at it? If I told you, come down to Costco, because we have never charged a higher price for couches. It's the highest the price has ever been, Blake. Hurry up and come down here and overpay for your couch. How exciting is that? Not very exciting. Not very exciting. Look at the market. Here it is. We are hitting all time highs. There's an old saying, buy when there's blood in the streets. That means you buy right here. You buy right here. What is the opposite of buy when there's blood in the streets? Sell when there's euphoria. All of my clients, thousands and thousands of people that listen to my podcast, thousands of clients, all of them say, Charlie, the stock market is the most expensive it has ever been. Should I buy? I say, no. What should I do? I say, sell. Is that me being a clairvoyant saying it's not going to go up higher? It is absolutely not that. It has never, ever, ever been this high. <laughs> Your account is as big as it will ever be. Well, well has, as, as big as it has ever been. It might go up from here. But what do conservatives do or what do people that are 50, 60, 70, kind of nearing retirement age or in retirement and can't afford to take these big losses, what do they do we're supposed to protect the assets and not lose them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Not selling is buying. And that is not something that most people understand. Would you buy the market when it's the most expensive it's ever been? Or would you buy a couch when it's the most expensive it's ever been? You would not. If you don't sell your positions, you are buying every day. You're rebuying in, you're rebuying in, you're rebuying in. So I am not telling people, hey, Let's go risk your capital to try to make this pathetic rate of return while the market's the most expensive it has ever been and we're due for a crash. That's terrible advice. Money, manager, money managers only give that advice because it's like if you sell pizza, what should I eat today? Pizza. Why? Because I sell pizza. Is it good for me? I don't care. I sell pizza. Eat pizza. Shut up and eat pizza. Why do money managers tell people not to sell or that the stock market still works, to be honest, that's their product. That's how they make money. It doesn't have to be immorality. It could be ignorance. Their bosses and managers could have told them this is good, blah, 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 not shown them what I'm showing you. When I went out and did the research as an independent fiduciary, I would never, not even, not even a single dollar, Blake, I would never leave a single dollar of my money or client's money in the stock market with these returns and it being at the highest it's ever been where we need a market correction. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, does that mean you have to go, oh, now my money can't grow. I'm going to not No. all the other alternatives. I mean, I found stuff that's made 24% per year for 17 years without even a hiccup, not even look at this. Look what the market does. It bounces around, right? Blah, 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 blah. That's called A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. It bounces, bounces, bounces. The investments I use instead of the stock market don't even do that. They've just gone up steadily and they've averaged over 24% a year, which is three, four, five times what the market has made. So 
First question, should somebody in retirement leave money in the market? First answer is no, because everything else does better. Second answer is maybe if they're a day trader and they know how to work the market to make 20, 30, 40% returns, but is the market doing what it did for your parents, grandparents, Dave Ramsey, what he, Dave Ramsey says the market makes 12%. Dave Ramsey has some incredible teaching on how to get out of debt. When Dave Ramsey moves into the stock market or cash value life insurance, one of only three places to make tax-free income, I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to sugarcoat it. He just, he's wrong. He, he says things that aren't true. He says the market makes 12% a year. That we cannot find that anywhere. All of the best financial advisors in the country are fighting Dave Ramsey saying, what are you talking about? Where do you get this 12? And I'm not saying he's a bad guy. I'm not saying he doesn't teach well. I'm just saying if you're an undisciplined human who cannot stop yourself from putting money on credit cards, Dave Ramsey is the answer. If you're a disciplined human being who's accumulated some assets, Dave Ramsey is dangerous. And I'm not, it's not my opinion. I, if I got on the phone with anybody who said, I love Dave Ramsey, I'd say, well, what does Dave Ramsey say? Dave Ramsey says, you make 12% in the market, but you should pay off your mortgage. Okay. Oh, let me think through that. I have $100,000 in the market. It makes $12,000 this year and it goes up because it compounds every year. But I'm going to take, I'm going to stop making $12,000 a year to pay off a mortgage at 3% and save myself a tax deductible 3,000 a year. What's better? Making 12 grand? or saving $3,000. Well, if I made the 12 grand and paid the three, I keep nine. What human being in the entire world ever thinking clearly, thinking honestly, without an ulterior motive, what human being would ever give up $12,000 a year, paying 3,000, keeping nine and say, debt is bad, I'm gonna give up $9,000 a year. And you know, I've written a book on this because I spent 22 years in the Christian church, multiple decades studying Susie Orman, Dave Ramsey, the traditional teachers saying debt is bad, debt is bad, debt is bad, debt is bad, debt is bad. And through my research, when I studied banks, insurance companies, the biggest corporations in the world, the richest human beings in the world, not-for-profit organizations, all of them strategically use debt on purpose when they don't need to, I ended up, by accident, a contrarian. What is a contrarian? Not a bad person, not an evil person. Not a, it's someone that says, I looked at the traditional way and found it to be wanting, found it to be lacking, because the alternatives to the traditional way provide, what do people want when they pay off a mortgage? They want to be wise financially. They want to be conservative. They want to be safe. They want to be smart. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The alternative to paying off a mortgage is more conservative, more wise financially, smarter. In every single way, it's better. And the difference, Blake, is debt is not bad. Well, debt can be bad, but liabilities are not bad. So if you owed $100,000 to somebody and you paid $1,000 a month to service the debt, but the $100,000 you got from that person you gave to an investment that gave you $2,000 a month, is there any scenario in the world where you'd go, I don't want the $2,000 a month anymore because it's costing me $1,000 a month. I'm just going to give up $1,000 a month because debt is bad. Susie Orman, Dave Ramsey told me that. The answer is no. What do the banks and insurance, what does every single major financial institution do? They pay commissions and they pay employees to get into more debt. Banks try to get people to put money in CDs. Insurance companies try to get people to put money in annuities and life insurance. Okay, they get that money. What do they pay on CDs? 1%, 2%. What do they pay on annuities and life insurance? 3 4 5 6%. Why are they doing that? Because when we look behind the scenes, you find what's called arbitrage, which is the sister to wholesale retail. Borrow low, lend high. What you find when you say, forget what the teachers teach, how does money really work? What you find is borrowing at 2% and earning 4%, you're, you're making a 100% rate of return. 
on your payment to serve. You're renting someone else's money, earning more on it, but is there any slavery? Because what people say is bad about debt is the slavery. You're a slave to someone else. Well, if you have the money in your right pocket to pay off the debt in your left pocket, there is no slavery. When I studied rich people, corporations, the wealthiest of the wealthy, they have the money to pay off their liabilities. There is no slavery. They choose every day not to pay off the liabilities as long as the liability is cheap and the assets are earning more than the life is if there's an arbitrage, they go, don't pay off debt, don't pay off debt, don't pay off debt. If they switch up and the debt costs seven and your assets are only making three, pay off the debt. It's very easy. Like this is not complicated at all. And most people have this huge aha. I mean, I wrote a book on this 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, it looks like this. Anybody can have it for free. The two ways to be debt free. It's only 28 pages. And it goes through what I learned back in 2005 in detail. So when I look at financial planning and retirement planning, and Blake, you got to understand this is just my opinion, right? I'm not saying I'm the, I'm, the, I'm, I'm the Jesus to the, I'm the savior. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying one guy who's pretty smart. If you look me up online, Charlie Jewett, you'll see what I've done. One guy came against the industry and said, really? Should you really pay off your house? Should you really postpone taxes to a later date? And should you really only use securities and put your money in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, diversify them and more risk equals more reward? One guy pushed against all of those traditions and found it's the worst financial plan on the, you, you could not possibly have more risk, more taxes or lower returns than to pay off your house, postpone taxes to a later date and only use stocks, bonds and mutual funds. I'm 48, I have hundreds, maybe thousands of clients. We don't have any money in the stock market. Why? Because we're anti-stock market? No, we're not anti-stock market. <laughs> because I've looked at all the investment options. What is investment planning about? Grow the money to a nest egg and then take an income from it. The definition of retirement planning is income. Do you agree? Mm, definitely. Income. The retirement means I left my job. If Social Security paid $10,000 a month, we wouldn't even have a retirement planning industry. Why would you? <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. if, so, if the arrangement was paying to Social Security when you retire, you get the same salary you had your last year, you get it forever. No retirement planning. Why do people even save? We save because one day we need that nest egg to create an income stream. Stocks, bonds, and mutual funds provide the lowest income stream with the highest risk of all of the options. And people don't know that because they're popular. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And because while your parents and grandparents were growing up in the 70s, 80s, 90s, that wasn't true. The stock market was crushing it. More risk did equal more reward because we were making, I don't know if this will take me back, not to that one. Let's put the numbers in. We were making Picture's worth a thousand words. I'm pretty auditory, but I've learned that pictures are helpful. <laughs> we were making 14% a year. That's where traditions come from. How did it used to work? What, what did it used to be like? The horse and buggy was really popular until the car came out. The stock market has become the horse and buggy of retirement planning. It was awesome until someone made something better. Today, losing money is optional. You don't ever have to lose money again. Today, the materials I've put out, you've probably seen them, on how to take a nest egg and turn it into an income, the stock market's the lowest income you could possibly take. If you're taking more than 20 or 30 grand from every million dollars, you are living in so much risk. I mean, the stock market maybe with the best minds in the industry, maybe you can take 2.8, 2.9%, call it three. Every million dollars, you can take $30,000 a year and you're still gambling that you might run out of money, okay? That might've been worth it when more risk was equal more, more reward. The next competitor, like if I didn't use the stock market, what would I use? 5%. Oh, if I didn't use that, what would I use? 
10 to 12% from every million dollars, you can take out 100 to $120,000 a year and never run out of money. Oh my goodness. The next competitor, $300,000 a year if structured properly in laddering. It's an outdated model. And a lot of the teachers, Susie Orman, Dave Ramsey, that learned 40 years ago, for whatever reason, I cannot say what their motives it. You do understand neither one of them will debate me. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. they're super famous. I always say they hurt so many more people than I help. Like they are, they're way more popular. You know, they hurt 900,000 people. I help 50 a year, whatever. They're popular. They sell a ton of books, the radio show. Why wouldn't they debate me? When I reach out and say, I think you're wrong on something. Can we have a conversation about it so I can learn from you? Or you can learn from me and all of our listeners grow, no matter who's right or wrong. Who cares who's right or wrong? Let's just find the truth. Why won't they debate me? Have they looked at my materials and said, oh, crap, he's right. He's going to be embarrassing to me. <laughs> Todd Langford said that. Garrett Gunderson, same thing. I cannot find anyone in the industry, even though I'm a no-name, cannot find anybody in the industry that will debate their position because they're making so much money from that position. I mean, if you're making $19 million a year saying two plus two is five, and someone says, hey, can we have a conversation about two plus two is actually four, not five? The most natural answer is that might cost me $19 million. Nah, I'll just stick with the deceit. I'll just, I'll just stay with my mistake because it's really profitable. Okay. I know that's a little dark. Maybe they're better than that. I'm just, I'm a little jaded because I love the truth. I love the consumer. I love reality and they won't even have the conversation. So if you have someone you bump into or people you care about as you're doing this and they have money in the market when they're nearing the retirement years or they're in retirement, or if they have a house that's paid off, or they say, I, I've been a fan of, of Dave Ramsey. The only question as a loving human being, being a friend to a person like that, the only question is, if there were information that if I gave it to you would literally change your life, cut your fees in half, cut your taxes in half or down to zero, give you twice as much income with more safety, would you like to have that information or not? The only answers are no and yes. I mean, if I say to somebody, I have a $50 bill, would you like to buy it for 10 bucks? And they say, no, what am I gonna do? They're like, I can't make them buy it. <laughs> you know what I mean? The old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, right? We can't make people be open-minded and want this for them more than they want it for themselves. What can we do? What does the waitress do? Would you like more coffee? Yes or no. They're both fine answers. It's either yes or no. There's no right or wrong. You know, she's not selling something. She's offering something, right? The only thing you can do for the people that you love and care about is say, do you know everything in the world? Are you 100% sure that you know everything about money and that your plan is perfect? If they're humble, they would say, no, like I like my advisor, but I, I can't say that. Okay. How much do you like your advisor? If a stranger was able to double your retirement income while cutting your risk and fees in half or eliminating all your taxes, would you want to talk to the stranger? Would you let a stranger give you $100 or is the relationship more important than the value to you? No, man, I don't care if I know the guy. I don't care if it's Hitler. Give me the hundred bucks. Uh, like value, the, the financial plan, the results of the financial plan are way more important than the financial, the financial planner, like who you get it from is less important than what you get. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All of my success. Look at me. I'm, I'm 48. I'm still too young for the industry. I barely have gray hair right here in my sideburn. Barely. You know what I mean? I've got, I have an okay net worth. You know what I mean? I have six kids. How much could your net worth be with six kids? <laughs> right. <laughs> I, like I'm barely old enough to be a financial advisor. And I started at 31, but what did I learn? being too young, too broke, too inexperienced, what I learned was I don't matter. You don't matter. The advisor your friends are working with doesn't matter. What matters is what's true and what do you have? What are you going to get? What's your money doing? Where is it? That's what matters. It's not the door to the room. 
It's the room you end up in. You and I are the door. You and I are the windshield to let people see clearly because we know they're going to make smart decisions when they see clearly. Toaster at Walmart, 40 bucks. Across the street, toaster's $20. Same toaster. Do you have to call your CPA? Do you got to call Edward Jones and, hey, should I spend 20 or 40? No, everybody knows. Same product, lower price, same area of town. Lower price is better. You're going to buy a Tesla, 78 grand, buy a Tesla, 120 grand, same Tesla. Cheaper is better. There's, there's ways that people make decisions. All of my success and all of the most successful advisors don't say, hey, shut up and trust me. You don't know things. I'm the professional. Let me do this. Like, no, none of us say that. The good guys. We say, let me show you options that have probably been hidden from you. And let me show you realities. Look at the screen one more time. I know I've already done it. The market made almost 14% per year for 30 years. But recently, six point, why is that not the front page of the news every day? What, who's talking about it? How would a consumer, your friend, my friends, how would they even know? Unless someone like us said, did you know that everything the financial services and retirement plans have been built on has changed? And by the way, in compound interest going from 13.78 to 6.59, that's not cutting it in half. That means you're making like 20, 30, 40% of what you used to make. And people don't know that. Our job is to lead the horse to the right water. We can't make them drink, but we certainly don't have to take them to a poison pool. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We certainly don't have to go, well, I know there's good water over there, but I'm only allowed to use this little muddy pond. No, there's no, you gotta be an independent fiduciary like you and I are and go, I can use any investment, any insurance product, any bank product, anything on the planet. I'm not Edward Jones where they make you only sell American funds. I'm not Fidelity where they make you only sell their mutual funds. We're not captive agents. We don't work for the man. We work for you. And did you know, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, that the market doesn't make what it used to make? Did you know all the competitors make more money? Did you know you could have three or four times more income with, with less risk? And what happens is I feel like retirement Santa Claus, and you do too, we're always delivering good news only for the person who says, if you can help me, I am not stubborn. I'm not arrogant. If you can help me and show me a better way, I want it. That's the question. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I know I'm a rambler. I know I'm crazy. Anybody's listening to my podcast know I'm a total nut job, but I happen to, you know, two heads are better than one. It's not which advisor you work with. It's how many advisors you have on your team. So if you meet somebody that has money in the market or has a home that's paid off or doesn't know how to take a tax-free retirement income, all you have to say is, would you like another professional possibly? Two heads are better than one. Charlie's head is pretty good. Would you like another professional on your team giving contrarian or alternative viewpoints all based on truth to help you see more clearly? If someone says no, nothing we can do. But when someone says yes, we just have a number of super comfortable conversations like we're doing right now. I mean, it's all I do all day, right? Just talk to you. Did you know you could do this? Did you know you could do that? Did you know you could do this? Did you know this is how it works? And people, every time, you know this, every time the response is, that sounds too good to be true. And why isn't everybody doing that? And then normally they end up at a place, and what if you die? Because they realize how valuable you and I are as the ones providing the information. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Any questions on that or for the people in your life or any specific situations or you think that's pretty good? I think it's good. I just, I mean, what's the solution? Well, the solution is to look at the alternative. So what happens is in the world of growing money and investing, you've got securities, stock sponsored and mutual funds, the market, that's the most powerful, one, most popular one. You've got bank products and you've got insurance products. There's real estate and businesses and things like that. But most of those aren't just investments. They, they require a little bit of your time. So they're more like part-time jobs or ventures, right? You, you can't be a real estate investor and be 100% passive. Even if you have property managers, you still have to manage the property managers, right? Mm -hmm. So the three big buckets 
bank products, let's call it market and insurance products, have all had their heyday. There was a time, if you go back far enough, there was a time our grandparents could sell the farm, make $200,000, stick it in the bank and take an eight or 9% rate of return from their savings accounts or their CDs. Literally the entire financial plan, the entire retirement planning industry was put your money in the bank and live off the interest. Why do we have this crazy like asset allocation and managed money and Edward Jones, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, Fidelity, Schwab. Why do we have all these companies that gamble in the stock market and do what's called a diversified portfolio? Because bank products had their heyday and then they stopped paying and they went down too low. People said, well, how am I gonna get the rate of return I need? And it became the stock market. Okay, cool. From 1970 to 1999, the stock market had its heyday, right? If the stock market was performing the way it did back then, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Just like if CDs were paying 9%, we wouldn't be having this conversation. <laughs> Sell everything, make 9%, never, never go without income, right? Mm -hmm. Bank products had their heyday, they got bad. Stock market had its heyday, it is not doing well in the last 21 years. What is for honest people, for honest people who approach the industry with no opinion and say, what is working? What you find is the insurance companies today are having their heyday. The insurance companies today are paying more rate of return, higher growth, better tax treatment, more guarantees, more extra benefits. Like, I mean, do you realize somebody's long-term care that's supposed to cost eight, nine, ten thousand dollars a month? I can have someone else pay for that like that. And it doesn't cost a penny where you keep your nest egg. You retire with a million bucks. You go, do I put it in the bank and they tax me every year on the interest and it's really low? Nope. Do I put it in the market where for the last 21 years, it's not making very much and I can't take a high income and there's risk of losses and there's capital gains. To nope. Could I put it with an insurance company where I grow it either guaranteed or tax free? And because they are an insurance company, they say, if you park your money with us instead of in the market and you need to go to a nursing home, we will pay $8,000 a month for the next four years while your body falls apart. Sorry to be so blunt, but when you go into a nursing home, like you can't do two of the act six activities of daily living, you can't feed yourself, can't transport yourself, can't toilet, you're, you're falling apart. It, like it takes like the average lifespan is about 2.3 years. They'll pay those nursing home bills out of their own pocket for four years if you park the money with them instead of with the competitors. Well, if the competitors paid 15% a year and the insurance companies paid seven, you go, oh my gosh, I have to make, I have to make half the rate of return, but I get the long-term care. I guess it's worth it, or I guess it's not worth it. We're not even in that situation. We have the competitors paying very little, banks pay almost nothing. The market's not doing well and it's due for a crash. And we actually have the insurance companies paying 30, 50, hundred percent more and throwing in the long-term care. So what is the answer? The answer is don't limit yourself to the stock market because hope is not a financial plan. I hope it works. That's not a financial plan. What I brought to the industry was the most comprehensive financial planning model that is available today. Mortgage planning, estate planning, retirement planning, insurance planning, and tax planning, which we call the merit plan, the merit model of financial planning nothing beats it. And there's, there's not even a chance that paying off your house and putting your money in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds can hold a candle. This is, that's like a snail competing with Michael Jordan in a dunk contest. You can't even come close. <laughs> Comprehensive always beats narrow, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Any other questions on that? I can't think of any. I'm sure I'll come up with more. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're an amazing man. You meet amazing people. I've, I've, I've heard you talk about some of the people in your life that you're helping and that you've helped. Oh, the only people we can help is the humble person that goes, if there's something better, I want it. And I don't care who it comes through. I'm sure your friends love you. Mm -hmm. But if they were like, Blake, I hate you. I hate everything about you. But if you can help me, I'll let you do it. Because it's not the messenger. It's what I get. It's the message. Mm -hmm. not the... It's not who sells me the car, it's the car I have to drive for the rest of my life. If they understand the value you could possibly bring to their life, 
I mean, is it true that we meet some people and pat them on the back and say, you're perfect. Don't change anything. Yes, it is. It still feels good. I don't hate my doctor when I go in and he tells me I don't have cancer. I love him. <laughs> but if I have cancer and it's small, I want to catch it now, right? Mm -hmm. So the normal good news we're delivering to people is I'm not going to charge you a fee. You don't have to pay anybody anything, but let's move a few things around and you get twice the retirement income or you have guarantees or something like that. So then keep up the good work, keep helping people. If you need my help, just ask me. But if you have friends that have money in the market or friends that have paid off their homes, you can have them read my book. It's free. Have a conversation with me. They, they really just need to go be a little humble and go, well, what else? What If this didn't exist, what would I do? What, what do other people do? If I didn't pay off my house, what do other people do and why'd they do that? If I didn't have my money in the market and I put it somewhere else, where would I put it? And why do people do that? Everybody, everybody loves what they learn when they open their mind and say, tell me, tell me what you know. And they always come yeah. back and go, this sounds too good to be true. And I go, I know. <laughs> How do, you, how do you like to prove to yourself that something's true? If I said I had Elvis in the next room and you said, I don't believe you, how could I prove it to you? I'd walk you into the next room. And if the dude is old and crusty and fat, singing nothing but a hound dog, there he is, right? When someone says it's too good to be true, a lot of times we just put them on the phone with the investment companies that offer these alternative tools and they go, is this true? And they go, yeah. <laughs> and 40 companies later, they're like, oh my gosh, that must be true. They just don't advertise in the Super Bowl. So you and I are, you know, retirement Santa Claus. We're evangelists. We're always spreading the good news. And people go, it sounds too good to be true. Well, are you humble enough? And would you put in the time to dig a little bit, watch a video, talk to a friend, read a book? If it were true and it could do incredible things in your lives, most people answer yes. Cool? Yes, it's cool. I hope everybody wants to learn more. I love. I, I hope a good money manager would want to learn more too, you know? I know they're a tough group of people to rescue, but money managers who come out the other side and say, let me add everything, not just manage money, actually do so much good for people. And we don't necessarily show up in people's lives and say, hey, fire your money manager. You shouldn't use them anymore. We show up and say, it's not which advisor you work with. It's how many advisors you have. Do you have somebody in your life doing the income plan? like the money tree where you never run out of money, no matter what happens in the market. Do you have somebody showing you how to take all that income completely tax-free? Do you have somebody doing home, equ home equity planning, showing you how to create an arbitrage, say for the, usually what happens is they're like, I don't have any of that, you know? I had a landscaper and he does the lawn. I don't have anybody fixing the whole house and repainting and re-roofing, you know what I mean? And we say, well, you may want us on your team. How much do you charge? Zero. <laughs> Why? Because just like when you buy a house through a real estate agent, they're paid through the seller, the person making the money, the entire industry. If you get away from stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, the entire industry, we get paid from someone else who's receiving the money. If we find a better place for the money, I do not have to charge a fee to the consumer. And it does sound too good to be true, but it's, it's not. It's the way it's worked for 17 years for me. Cool. Yes. Very cool, Charlie. Awesome. Thank Keep you. Helping your friends. Okay. Thank you, Charlie.